we have spent a lot of time focusing on how to draw a correct ER diagram. It might seem like a lot of effort to you, but to be honest, it's really truly worth it. When you build a correct ER diagram, there are certain rules you can follow to guarantee that the physical database you set up will actually work. It will actually store the information you need. It will store it correctly. It's very easy to build a physical database that doesn't work after a few years or doesn't even work when it's first released. So we are now going to go through the rules to convert an ER diagram to a physical data model. And if you follow these rules exactly, you won't go wrong. There is a series of prescribed steps to apply to your entity relationship diagram to convert that diagram into a physical model of a relational database. We're going to go through each of these seven steps in the next few slides, and it's important to understand the rules of conversion. Sometimes a step may give you more than one option for conversion, which you will have to consider. But if you follow these seven steps, you are guaranteed to have a very strong physical relational database model. There are two more steps at the bottom for expanded entity relationship models. We will cover those in an upcoming video. While we are converting our ER diagram to a physical model, there are three goals to keep in mind. The first goal is to preserve all information all the attributes, all the data that we've described, the entity types, everything in our diagram has to be represented in some way or be able to be calculated in some way from the database. The second is to ma maintain the constraints to the extent possible. The constraints can be total participation. The constraints can be a one-to-many relationship. And then our third is to minimize null values. We don't like to see a lot of null values in our database. On to step one, mapping regular entity types. It should not surprise you that every entity type becomes a table in your physical database. So for every regular entity type, we wanna make a table that includes all of the simple attributes of that entity type. If you had an attribute that was underlined, that meant it was a primary key candidate. You can pick one of those to act as the primary key for your table. What if there were no attributes that were underlined? In other words, there were no attributes that could be a primary key candidate. Well, in that case, you as the database designer would just have to choose to add an additional attribute in the physical model that might not have been present in your ER diagram. Similarly, there could be entity types that have a potential primary key. So for example, the primary key could be social security number for a person. But you might decide that social security number is not a good primary key when you build your physical database. And you might decide that rather than having to have a social security number associated with the person as the key, that you would prefer a more meaningless key, maybe a person ID. And the person ID could be an auto increment field. So the first person is one, the second person is two, the third person is three. So you don't have to worry about putting in the person's social security number correctly. The idea of having a simple, numeric, meaningless primary key is a very good idea. And so if your ER diagram did not have such a key, for example, in the person entity type, you are certainly allowed to add an additional attribute when you make your physical model. And that attribute could be person ID. Remember that we are only putting in the attributes that are simple attributes from your diagram. That means composite attributes are not put in. Imagine a composite attribute called name 
that consists of the simple attributes, first name, middle initial, and last name. You would not put the composite attribute into the physical database because it's not a simple attribute. But its components would be simple. And so first name, middle initial, and last name would all go into the database. Also, derived attributes should never go into the database. A derived attribute, by definition, is an attribute that you can calculate or figure out from other data. Well, if you can calculate it or figure it out, you should never put that into your database. Let the database do the work to calculate those derived fields. And if you have a multi-valued field, a multi-valued attribute, that too is not simple. That would not go into your physical diagram. We'll talk about multi-valued attributes later in an upcoming slide. Now let's move on to step two. Step two is the mapping of weak entity types. I've got good news for you. The way to map a weak entity type is exactly the way to map a strong or regular entity type. You do all the same things that we discussed in step one. There's only one difference. Because it's a weak entity type, it depends on adding to the physical database table the primary key of the strong entity type upon which it depends. So step two, pretty straightforward. Follow step one and then add in the primary key of the strong entity that adds a unique identifier for every row of the table.